Hey there, this is Robert, and you are listening to The Robert Bud Show. I want to thank you for tuning in, whether you are a return listener or a brand new listener. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming and, and checking out the show. Today we have Brandon Glade. And I'm not going to say too much about Brandon. We go over a lot in the show. Um, we really get into his past, present, future um, Brandon is a, just a little bit of background, Brandon's a prof, uh, fitness professional here in Carlsbad, San Diego, in the San Diego area, and he's an amazing guy, amazing athlete. He does, um, can I use the word amazing one more time? He does amazing things in the community. I'm going to use it. So, uh, like I said, I'm not going to say too much. I'm just going to get right into it. So, without further ado, here is Brandon. All right. So the first thing I, for a sound check, I always ask is, what'd you have for breakfast? Uh, this morning I had a gluten-free egg white Canadian bacon sandwich from Starbucks and the classic oatmeal, which has a dash of uh, a montage of nuts and berries. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Because I, I had to get out the door to work and then get to the funeral after that, so I didn't, uh, I didn't have a chance to. Starbucks isn't my only choice but it it's convenient yeah yeah any i like starbucks though you know i know they're a corporate monster but i like them any in particular like why gluten-free and then because it was their new sandwich Uh other than that i get the reduced fat turkey bacon sandwich but this was the new gluten-free canadian bacon egg white sandwich Ah, so the new caught your eye yeah well and all their sound they all have like this long sentence for just one sandwich (laughs) You know. Yeah, that's what—that's the, hence the corporate monster. Yes, yeah, absolutely, it's, it's great. Eat everything up. So. Um, speaking of diet, you, you are—I've always known you, known you as an uh, in impeccable shape. Is there any in particular diet you follow, or you know, is it um, all the working out you do? Like, you know, what's your what's your secret if there is one? Well, I, I think it all stems back to just. Genetics, and what I mean by that is I'm a full-blown attention deficit hyperactive disorder kid, which means I have a coal furnace metabolism. Does that mean I eat whatever I want? Uh, to a certain extent, I don't. I don't. I don't watch what I eat in the sense of um, count calories. I'm not taking the stage or posing. Do I make sure that I have quality meals? Absolutely. I'm not uh, opposed to um, eat some sour skittles in the middle of the day i don't make a habit of that either but um i'm not a huge like it's got to be this that or the third um but i don't make a habit of those things too i think if you work very hard on your body um and this is just my opinion um that yeah man go have some pizza live live somewhere in that bell curve that keeps you happy because if you're not a competitor which that's a brutal area or an apex athlete then you know you can stay in shape and still have a cheat meal here or there. You know, stay away from fast food, though. That stuff will kill you. But either and other than that, you know, that's, yeah. In fact, to be honest, I went snowboarding last week, and, and it would probably been 9 million years since I had McDonald's. So me and the lady friend had some McDonald's on the way up the hill. We got to the top of the hill, and I said, holy cow, I feel like I ate a bowling ball. Like, I didn't feel like I was going to have, like, diarrhea or anything like yeah. that. And uh, can we say diarrhea on here? Uh, you can say yeah, whatever yeah. you want. Uh, but I definitely <laughs> was like, you can, you can say you can, fucking you, diarrhea you can, if you want. Yeah, you can taste all the shit. <laughs> that mm. they just. But I'll tell you what, going So I had the Super Mac meal. I had the McGriddled sandwich, strawberry shake, uh, and the, the obscene amounts of fries because we all know McDonald's fries are, unless they get cold, yeah. hot are no, nothing short of full addiction. So, uh, but that was it. Um, so back to the point. In the but this, that was in one meal. That was in one and meal. And you were surprised it felt like a bowling ball? No, I wasn't surprised. Okay. I wasn't. I was just happy that I felt like I had a bowling ball as opposed to shitting one out. You yeah. know? That came later. But uh, <laughs> but as far as that, no, I stay, I stay pretty clean, though. I definitely, um, I'll keep my breads um, morning time and then pre-workout time. Um, and... When I grind, I grind hard, and my style is not any other style other than what makes me happy when I train. Um, so I make sure that I eat according to that, but I don't squander my, especially because I come from um, a family that, um, you know, was you know, Marine Corps, very buttoned up, 
Um, but there's heart disease. So you can look like a Greek god on the outside, but your arteries are just as thrashed and plaqued up as somebody who's obese looking. So um, since I have a predisposition for that, I have to be careful with, you know, the lipids and the bloodstream and, and uh, getting checked out and stuff like that, um, which is funny because I say get checked out. I haven't been to the hospital <laughs> since I blew my knee out skating and skateboarding in 2012. I don't like hospitals unless... <laughs> The shit hits the fan, yeah. which that's what it takes for me to go to the hospital. Insurance or not, I'm not trying to go to the hospital. Um, I don't go to the hospital unless it gets just that bad. So. Yeah. We're extremists, so it's got to be extreme before you take care of it. You know? Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I don't step foot in the hospital. Let's just go, go see somebody else and decide. Well, know, that and, too. And that, yeah. It's like, oh, I don't, even, I don't even want to be here. So that's why I think um, insurance is such a joke for myself because I'm like, when's the last time I've gone? But insurance is like, oh, you got to have it because, you know, that one time when the shit hits the fan. Brutal. But yeah, there could be a whole conversation in itself. Um, so, well, I've never said thank you so much for being on the show. I really hey, appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, it. Rob. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, Rob, well, you're 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 a you know you're a, a man of passion, and I recognize that from the day I met you, and you're badass at what you do. So, if I can sponge off of you, you know that makes my life better, makes my style of coaching better, it makes my kettlebells better, you know, because you've been doing a whole lot longer than me, you know, and uh, and I think that's what makes the coaching personal training community, if you will, better because. Um, Let's face it. Let's be real. Too many of these motherfuckers talk shit about each other. When they see each other in their faces, they might as well be kissing each other. And I, I you know, I'm a head-on collision. So if I if I got a tr- problem with you, I'm going to come tell you to your face. And that's the problem I have with the training world. But back to the point. It's my pleasure to hook you up, Rob, because you've always hooked me up in, in a smile and a handshake and positivity, and that goes a long way. People don't people overlook that, you know, because this is a, we live in a let's face it, we live in a day and age of social media and just hate Muslims and hate Christians and hate Trump and hate Obama and hate, 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 dislike yeah. instant, instant messages to our face, whether it's a form of a tablet, a phone or your flat screen TV. So if we can breathe a little positivity, it goes a long way. And you've been good at that without even noticing it. Mm. Right on brother. Yeah. I, hey, I really appreciate that. Up. Yeah. I, I, I've always found it way easier to be nicer and smile and have an upbeat attitude. And you just attract those, you know, those people that have the same same thing going on and why not, you know, spread it around. Somebody's having a, a hateful day, you know, yeah. uh, you know, smile and, and, you know, be loving and kind and, you know, yeah. spread it. Yeah. Well, let's face it. <laughs> How many coaches do you know, and I know, we won't say any names, that didn't want to be men of integrity in their lines of work, and how many facilities have they jumped around to, mm. you know? So it, it goes a long way. And at the end of the day, if you have to kick a motherfucker in his head, you kick him in his head, but that's the last resort. Yeah. <laughs> Carry a big stick, right? <laughs> that's it, man. That's not, it. Not, not afraid of doing that. No, yeah. no. Well, I got two strikes now, so I can't kick nobody to work my freedom. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh so what is it that got you into, you know, fitness and uh, being active? Was it the uh, hyperactivity or was it, you know, an influence in your family or? Well, yeah, I mean, great question. Uh, it, the answer is as simple as as a kid, I was hyperactive. Like my and my dad, God bless it. God rest his soul and bless his heart. He saw that. So he had me in football, baseball, basketball, skateboarding, surfing. And mind you, when I started skating and surfing, it was an influence of my two older brothers. In 1985, I was seven years old, and they built a ramp in the backyard. And they weren't even really big into, into that, but my parents were so cool that they let them. So I was influenced at that at a young age, and then I played all your normal fundamental sports, if you will. But I really excelled at those individual sports. So being active was a part of my life from day one. But how I got in to this is that what you want to know how i got into training Mm -hmm. um well there's a lot of events that lead it up to that but if i want to hit a bullet point on the memo it would be um after i got into trouble um and i was doing my first prison term like a lot of guys that got into training i'm not the only story um i started working out i started loving it i felt the results um i could knock out you know 500 burpees quicker than anybody on the yard and and uh we would have competitions and um, and it was just fun, and I like love the endorphin rush, and and uh, I was like, you know, I could sell a ketchup popsicle, so which is that's one of my sayings. So I was like, what I mean by that is, if I enjoyed fitness and I could make money at it, I ran across an ad in a muscle fitness magazine that the guy sell next to me had, 
uh, across an international sports sciences ISSA ad. Mm-hmm. Say, it's call this number, you can make great money, make a living, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, cool. Because I my, my whole mission statement when I got locked up was treat it like you're at college. Leave a better man than when you came in, mm-hmm. hopefully. Right? Because a lot of guys don't. They just become... They, they, they graduate with a PhD in criminality. Um, and not everybody has... You know, a lot of people have my story, too, where they took it and they, they turned it positive. So I called home, had, you know, well, God rest her soul, grandma put down the... It was like 700 bucks at the time. Um, and that was it. I got it. They said, yeah, we do correspondence course. We'll make... Yeah, um, we clear it with the prison. He can... You know, we'll send him all the curriculum. And um, some of the stuff they actually held on to, which was a DVD and a VHS tape. Because mm-hmm. um, it was right at the time when, I mean, this was a long time ago, where DVDs and VHSs were still in the battle <laughs> of what was better. Mm-hmm. So I had both, but I couldn't have that in myself because there's nothing I could play it on anyway. Um, and I remember reading an article um, to this day. He's like, I never got to meet the guy. I don't know if he's around, but his name was Dr. Squat, Dr. Frederick Hatfield, you know, Olympic weightlifter and um, just awesome. And and that was it. I was just like, dude, this is cool. I can turn this into a career. Um, And I started training in there and I started, people saw me studying all the curriculum they sent me and learning about anatomy and, and, and all that good stuff. And and then I started kind of working with guys in there, not training them, but it's like, hey, we want to, you know, because I was just taking stuff I saw out of any magazine I can get a hold of. Because at that point, I was sold out on it, you know. And we were, they had just taken weights out of the prison system because dudes were getting their heads crushed like watermelons, you know, like, oh, that's the guy that freaking said uh-huh. did this or that. He's on the bench press. Let me go take this 45 pound plate to his jawbone. Um, <laughs> While well, he's under the bar. Yeah, <laughs> he's not gonna do nothing. Yeah, um, and he won't move after. He's got that. his hands full. And so yeah, so as horrible as that is, it is what it is. And and, and but so we didn't have so anytime we can get like a pillowcase and fill it up with rocks, um, or have someone stand on your back or put pressure and do push, hold you while you're doing pull ups. Anything, the creativity and ingenuity. What a lot of people don't realize on dudes that are incarcerated that get in shape, um, because you only have so much because they don't have weights in there. Um, and you learn how to, if you can get, if you can get swole or ripped or in shape in a seven by 12 prison cell, you can do it anywhere. And if you learn how to coach people, you don't need much room to get them in shape either because of where you've learned. Right. Um, so that's where it all happened, man. My first prison term, Calipatria state prison way out in the desert in uh, Imperial County um, in, you know, Southeast California. Um, that's where it all started for me, you know, and, and, it, and it, I had my battles in life, but I always, fitness was always there, that it was a gift God had given me that I didn't really tap into, and that was one of the blessings in disguise was I found fitness and I found being in shape and how much I loved about it in my first prison term. Hmm. That's um, uh Funny, but I was uh, certified by ISSA for the first, you know, the first time I got yeah. cert- and Dr. Squat. I was um, I was powerlifting, and I used to read all about Dr. Squat, and I'm like, oh shit, you know, why would I do any other certification? But ISSA, so that's what I did. Yeah, well, that. you know, I think it's a money thing, not to get off the subject, but uh, you know, NASM is great. I've I've done that, and I've done ACE and all of them until you know I went back and got my degree. Um, and by the way, if you guys listen to this, if you want to donate uh, to pay off my student loans, that'd be great. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> I'm kidding, but, but I'm not. But, you know, it's just a money thing, too. It's like, well, all the gyms, like, so I got out, right? Uh, Paul Henniker, mm-hmm. um, who's a huge mentor of mine, um, pretty much taught me everything I knew in the sense of sales and, you know, making it your own. Like, you're going to learn stuff from everybody. Nothing you make up, but you make it your own. Mm-hmm. So he got me the job at Frogs. That's where I met Jason, waiting, and... Um, but they were like, you know, we only recognize NASM, we don't recognize ISSA. And I'm like, so I just spent time and money and effort and energy on a cert that you guys don't, or, or no one else for that matter recognizes. Yeah. And this was back in 2004. Um, and uh, it, is what, it, it is what it is, you know, but they ended up hiring me anyway. And... Um, and for that, I was grateful. But yeah, I used to say it was, it was awesome. I was at anybody that asked me, I was like, well, I tell them the truth. They go, NASM is what everyone's going to recognize yeah. as the apex of all those certification agencies, but they're all good. You're all going to learn. And their whole, I've read the books now as opposed to the, I still have all my old everything. 
um, all the case studies I did, and you know, I kept it all. But um, you know, make sure you do a- NASM if you go into anything, because then you're going to be wondering, like me, like, oh, gee, why did I just waste money? On? Right. They recognize nothing's that. a waste, but still, yeah. <laughs> yeah. NASM plays pays these big corporate gyms a lot of money to represent NASM. Yeah. What What are um, a myth or some myths that in the fitness industry that you would love to be like that's bullshit and I'm gonna clear that up right now. Oh, um, I don't know why this is the first one came to mind because it's not my thing, but I think people think if you shoot steroids in your ass, you're gonna become this monster. But I don't think people realize when you see these freaks that are huge, these dudes eat, sleep, drink, and drive weight all day, every day. They eat. 20 billion calories a day. The caveat to that is, on top of all that, they shoot hormones in their butt cheek. You're not if you're out there and you want to do some tests and stuff like that because it's in the industry. But you don't want to. You think you can work out half ass and get? Nah, that ain't the case. That's a freaking myth. Um, you don't need to do it anyway unless you think you're going to take the stage because that's another myth. That all those dudes are not natural. <laughs> you know, not that you thought that they were, but. Uh, um, that's definitely a big myth right there, though. It's like yeah, there's no magic pill to fitness. Mm. There's no, there's no freaking fad. There's no diet. There's no style. It's what what you're willing to work hard for and get results for. Because it took me three to four years to get the base that I've had for the past 16, 17 years. Mm. So, you know, I mean, yeah, the fitness myth is there's no there's no get fit quick. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah, that's a um, one of my huge pet peeves. Is like, oh yeah, these guys are cheating because they're doing this, and they, you know, and it's like, no, they're working their ass off. And yes, they're using whatever they're using. But what what would be something that you would tell your, um, say, your sixteen year old self now? You know, what what advice would you give yourself? Well, real simple for me. I mean, the first thing that comes to my head just because of how much I allowed it to dictate situations and ruin my life would be you know stay away from drugs and alcohol Mm. it's weed's practically legal now um and is very very sugar coated but to me weed was always the first stepping stone to gnarlier shit so if i could tell myself at 16 kind of grab myself by the shoulders and go you know look not everyone's going to have some people go out and get loaded on whatever they want and they're weak and warriors and they don't let it ruin their relationships their families their marriages their work and what have you um, but that's what I tell my 16 year old self man is because um, there's a saying at least in my family drugs and alcohol didn't run in my family it galloped so it eventually galloped right all over my ass uh, and I'm just lucky to live to tell the tale but um, yeah definitely you know it's tough what you tell 16 year old self you know because you think about how it is now as opposed to just what it was when i was 16 back in 1993 Mm -hmm. 92 93 94 somewhere around there um you know it was different but you know that and and you are who your friends are so if your friends are piles of shit you're stinking right next to them Mm -hmm. so you know What, what would you tell your parent of your 16 year old self like if you're on the outside and and I know your dad was a huge influence in your in your life. I mean, your family was a huge yeah. influence in your life. Like, what would you, um, if you saw yourself and you noticed it and you're like, hey, Papa. Hey, I'm going to move you to the middle of Montana before you're 18 and don't have a choice <laughs> to take you away from this BS out here that you're getting caught up in. No, um, you know, I don't think there's really anything that myself as a parent could tell myself as a 16 year old kid other than that if you don't listen the world has two things outside it's outside these doors there's beauty and there's the beast and you can have one or you can have the other but that beast will fucking kick your ass and what i mean by that is is being influenced by negativity um and thinking that it's going to be fun or cool um and or the beauty aspect of it is if you want to work hard, study, and find something you love, you don't have to go to college out of high school. Mm-hmm. I think that's in our culture. You graduate and you go into college and this and that. That's cool. Um, but um, that and find what I, I think the biggest thing now, I'm kind of veering off, but is if I was the dad of my 16 year old self, I'd say, son, find something you're passionate about and go all out and, and don't, let your, don't let your dreams be dreams. Mm. Let your dreams be so big they freaking scare the shit out of you. Yeah. 
and go with that. Not that my dad didn't know, because, I mean, thanks to my dad, he allowed me to skateboard back in the 80s when most parents were like, you know, for one, it was a major subculture. It's not, everything's corporate now, so nothing is subcultured anymore. Um, but I was able to make a living at it at one point in my life. Um, at that point, the action sports industry was all, also a lot of partying, which I didn't mind because I was right in the mix of it. But um, definitely, that would be it. I tell I tell tell myself, you know, follow your dreams, find something you're passionate about, and go at all out, mm. and I'll and I'll be there to back you up as long as it's some healthy and, and good. So, yeah. Uh, say more about that. Like, how how did you get into um, skating, pro skating, and and well, like I said, it, it, my two older brothers are probably my, my heaviest influence. Uh, my oldest brother Morgan to this day is still in the music industry so growing up he was always about um, you know like I said a subculture right he was into punk rock when dude if you're walking down the street back in that time with a freaking pink mohawk or what have you or just dyed green hair like dude you're gonna get beat up by a group of construction workers just because (laughs) you look a certain way Mm. Um, you know nowadays everything is just the norm Mm. because of the way technology's advanced stuff and instant information and you know, the advent of like hot topic, right? Where uh, that that place is like the corporate monster that caters to like the goth kid mm-hmm. and the you know speed metal kid, but they've you know cor- you know made it so corporate that once again the stuff that used to be subcultures isn't. Yeah. So, um, but my brother Morgan was that. So I grew up, you know his music influence was huge on me and he was into everything from you know he's an accomplished drummer to this day works in the music industry lives up in Hollywood of course um you know from you know just underground punk rock whether it was from the UK or New York hardcore or LA watch his bands uh practice in the backyard or in the garage because my mom and dad were super cool so I watched that happen he was never he skated but he wasn't like you know sold on it but, um, you know, then all the metal, too. He was into metal and, and everything from, like, poison, hair metal to, you know, you know good old standard Metallicas and Slayers like that. And then... I listened to some White Snake on the way over yeah, here. Yeah, White Snake. It's all good for you. <laughs> you know, it's real music. They actually play instruments in that yeah. shit. Uh, and, yeah, like, my first two albums I ever bought were uh, Run DMC, Raising Hell, nice. and uh, Ride the Lightning by Metallica Hell, when yeah. I was a kid. First two cassette tapes I ever went out and actually purchased on my own. So here you have those two polar opposites. Now, they're my brother Evan. My brother Evan was more of the jock side where he didn't really play the, like I call them, fundamental sports, baseball, basketball, football. He did all that back in your fundamental ages of Pop Warner and whatnot. Um, but Evan was, you know, an accomplished martial artist, you know, taekwondo, judo. He was winning championships in high school I got to be the crash test dummy <laughs> so I grew up tough because Evan was a middle brother and uh, and he was also a ginger too so you know those gingers got a little snap to him um, <laughs> yeah. and I got to be the brunt of all that too uh, he just never no one messed with Morgan because he was the artist and he just stayed away from everybody so but Evan had a heavy influence on that aspect because now I wanted to be a badass so they built a ramp in the yard in 1985, and the rest is pretty much history. That was it. I was, I was already dropping in and doing tricks at seven years old. Um, I was, dad was entering me in little street contests that were just a couple little wedge launch ramps and some parking curbs, and maybe just a portable fire hydrant to do like a boneless over. Back in the 80s, you know, I got a picture. Uh, actually, it's right there where Trader Joe's is in Encinitas in the parking lot right there. That used to be a van store back in the 80s, and I have a picture of me just cruising through the parking lot like that at, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old at that very contest. So my dad always had my back regardless of, you know, what how America had viewed skating at the time. Um, but it was definitely on a rise, too. You know, everyone thought it was cool. It was fun. You know, you had... You know, Farrah Fawcett and shit and commercials on skateboards and just obviously everyone's seen Dogtown and Z-Boys, but that's a document everyone knows of now. If you weren't in the scene, then you didn't know who those dudes were because as we viewed it, you weren't cool enough to know who Jay Adams was right. and, and, and you know, Peggy Oki and all the other, you know, rippers that were out of Venice and Santa Monica where there was a, that was a true donning of a subculture up there um, with the suicidal tendencies, that scene, because it was that was what skating was at its core. You didn't have to be white, black, Mexican, Islander, Asian, whatever, you know, accepted everybody. And I think that was the beauty that I found in skateboarding, too, was I had freedom to be me 
and I didn't have to be on a team and I didn't have to fit a certain criteria. I could be creative with my own freedom and being an ADD kid, that worked out perfect. <laughs> yeah. And then my dad was a surfer, so skating and surfing were like hand in hand. But I dropped in on a ramp before I ever rode a wave standing up. Um, I always boogie boarded, but, and then skating just came a thing for me through high school. I got sponsored in high school. wasn't I wasn't a big time guy, but I was good enough to, you know, travel around. Then I rode for a longboard skateboard company uh, called TVS, and we got to go all over the place and have fun. And I got made fun of at the time by all my guys that still rode normal size skateboards, which was cool. But I'm like, yeah, I'm flying and getting paid some chicken scratch, but it's just, you know, it's. I'm 19, 18, 19 years old. That's the dream. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then something that's never left me, like, to this day, I was just talking to my buddy last week, you know, skateboarding and surfing, people go, like, especially skating, because surfing is a little more cool. It's the beach. It's, you can go to tropical locations. But skating is like, I think viewed as a lot of people, it's a toy. Mm-hmm. It's a little kid's game or whatever. Like, well, you still skateboard? Like, yeah, it's not what I do. It's who I am. It's in my blood. It's how I was raised. It was my influence. Just like if anybody grew up in a family full of wrestlers in Ohio, you're probably going to be a wrestler. You know, I grew up with a brother that was a skater and a martial artist, so I grew up loving to fight and skateboard. My dad was a surfer, so I liked to surf. My oldest brother was into drums and punk and metal, so I was into drums and punk and metal. So you mix that together, boom, you know? And then, of course... We're all a bunch of sour freaking Charger fans now, too, so <laughs> yeah. being a San Diegan. But it, it, that that's beside the fact. But, um, yeah, the skating, you know, is just a part of the, uh, of you know, n- not only that, but my training style today, you know. Mm-hmm. Because I'll tell you what, action sports until the past, I'd say it's been 15 years now. But um, surfers, skaters, snowboarders, wakeboarders, moto guys, BMX guys, whatever the case may be, they didn't... Uh, they, everyone everyone associated training with being a meathead or a bodybuilder, not being functional, making the muscles around your joints stronger, not making yourself stronger. Because like I tell all my guys that I work with, whether in the X Games or snowboard or surf or whatever the case may be, I can never make you better at skating, surfing, or snowboarding, but I can make you stronger. I can make your rotational aspect stronger. Um, we can keep injury at bay because those joints around or those muscles around your joints are stronger but you have to displace the myth that training until they actually get into a session with what i do and my specialty they get it you know they get it they get it on a cerebral level you know firing off the central nervous system it ain't about doing curls and you know but um and that's where all that has changed and i've been blessed with the influence of my skateboarding and my other board sports to make my coaching and my training what it is now but being on a rotational aspect it's allowed me to work with ufc fighters and and nfl guys you know i've i've got i've been god has very blessed blessed me very much with i never pigeonholed myself i I allowed my my style of training to kind of cross many boundaries and uh and that all directly correlates back to that first activity i ever did which was skateboarding in 1985 so no, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. What, what was what's a, a major um, uh, turning point in your life when um, it could have gone something like what was, like it could have been could have been jail. It could have been uh, a death in the family. It could have been something that you, you know it could have made or break you when you realize that this life is short. I'm going to get my shit together and I'm going to make something of myself or something. You know. Well, you know, this is, this is probably where I get, start getting a little choked up, but, uh, you know, it was real simple. I was, uh, I blew my knee out skating in 2012. Um, at that time, I'll give you a couple of events that led up to that aha moment, if you will. Um, like I said, I'd got out of my final prison term in 2008 Jason hired me back at Frogs, being the freaking saint that he is, and, and he believed in me and helped me believe in myself. Um, and I really, I really didn't wasn't resting on my laurels of what I knew I needed to do. I was just lucky that people saw something in me, whether they knew it was going to happen that day or a week from there or two months or a year, but they knew that I was capable of, you know, giving back and helping people. Because at the end of the day, that's all I want to do. 
And Jason had hired me back. I just got out of my second prison term. Um, I, I got a job at the fire academy. Jason, Isaiah, which I didn't really want to bring that name up, but it is what it is. You know, hey, you know what? He did what he did. That's not my business, but the dude had a fucking vision and a dream. And we all mounted up and we left frogs. And I worked with those guys and didn't get paid for three or four months. And I didn't give a shit because re- God had a timeline for me. That timeline was, well, you can go with those guys. You can study your EMT stuff at that time because you're going to need time to do that anyway. Mm-hmm. So go sit at the front desk. And that's kind of like when you and I had met. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when that had happened. And I wasn't strong in my sobriety. You know, my sobriety, I, or I always relate everything to a muscle. If you don't work it out, it grows weak. So my sobriety is the same way. If I don't be of service, give back, as we say in AA, clean house, trust God, and help others, um, I knew I was going to use again. So Jason and Isaiah kind of like, hey, dude, you know, we know you really love the fire th- thing, and we can't really afford you to build up your clientele base, leave them high and dry, and go fight fires for the wildfire season. And I understood that. I got it. It sucked, but but they still allowed me to go, you know, the season of 08, left to fight fires, came back, worked there, went back to fight the fires again in 09. Um, and then that came back again. And then I think 2010 is when they're just kind of like, you know, people go to Robert Budd because they go to – they like Robert. They could, you know – Correct me if I'm wrong, but they can really give a rat's ass about your kettlebell skills. They like how you empower them. Mm-hmm. You make an impact on their lives because of you, who you are, and the way that, that channels into their soul. So, with that being said, those people didn't want to go train with other coaches there because they came for me. And that was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I just thought, you know, I was another guy open. You know, I knew I had charisma and I was funny and, and I had passion about what I did, but I didn't think about it that deep. So, finally, it was just like, you know, it's go fight fire and then collect unemployment in the off season and maybe train a couple people, make some under the table money at a park. Um, and then I started getting high again and, you know, I, I knew what I was doing. I knew I was on a slippery slope and, uh, I was skateboarding a uh, park in Oceanside. I came off doing a, a grind. I, slipped out blew out my my left knee um and at that time i was coming off the 2011 season it was february of 2012 when i this had happened and my fire captain and my squad boss and the fire superintendent called me in and said brandon we love you you've been a godsend to us but during the 2011 season, because I was using drugs, I was, I was, it was horrible. Like you said, you say anything on this podcast, I'll tell you, man. I was, which is very, very, uh, it's still, I pissed myself off, but it's, it's just a part of the story that I'll never do again. But I was showing up to fires, you know, thank God there was, there's only a few people's lives in my hands, let alone, you know, running into a burning building while I was high on speed and shit like that, you know, where I was losing sleep and, getting the, the buzzer and going to respond to a wildfire, you know, just out there fighting wildfire where you got to look out for your crew. And, uh, so I, 2011, I didn't, I didn't, uh, the, I would, I'd get called to fires. I was either, you know, high or drunk or whatever, kind of hit it from them. Um, and then I was late to fires, which is a huge no, no. So basically before they started the, the end of the season in 011, I kind of was, I was fucked up and I was screwing up. And then the starting of 2012 happened, and I was skating. I blew my knee out. I limped in there. They basically said, you know, they didn't fire me. They said, hey, Brandon, we're going to let some rookies give it a shot. I'm sure you understand. They didn't say, you know, hey, we know that you're going through some shit. And you need to clean your shit up. You know, and I was okay. And I was hurting, man. I was I was hurting because I couldn't, I couldn't point the fingers at nobody else except myself. And uh, so that went from getting addicted to because I'm an addict an alcoholic of you know the most extreme nature so I went from having no insurance speaking of insurance earlier in the podcast my buddy was a wakeboarder blowing both his knees out multiple times had just like this sandwich bag full of Norcos and I was just popping them like Skittles and I blew through those and I found out of this drug called Oxycontin and I always made fun of people that were like pill poppers and heroin addicts because I was a tweaker so I was always up you know and these people are all nodding off I'm like I'm never gonna miss a thing look at you fucking guys <laughs> stupid like really I was just looking at me you know yeah. 
So next thing you know, it goes from taking all those Norcos to my buddy going, dude, try this. So he crushed it up. I snorted it. It was the most amazing feeling I ever felt. Felt like somebody hugged me with a warm, fuzzy blanket on a freezing cold day. And I just felt like I was, everything was okay. The world could have been going to freaking straight mayhem around me, but I was at peace. And that was it, man. And with the addict mentality like I have, I took that shit and ran it all the way into the ground. What I mean by that is it culminated into an Oxycontin addiction, snorting it. Couldn't afford those at the end of the day at 20 bucks a pill. And if you have an eight pill a day habit, you do the math. And I don't make that kind of money. So I'm like, well, I might as well just go smoke heroin because it's cheaper and it's an opiate too. It's the, They both come from the same plant. One's just a little bit more engineered in a lab or you know straight off the streets mm-hmm. so I was uh, 22 days back into my sobriety so I'd, I'd, I'd started using pretty heavily after that all through 2012 um, I uh, I was using probably smoking a half gram of heroin a day nobody knew I just I still had clients they didn't know you know I was just waking up to use it almost to be functional not really even get high um, and I finally got sober on my own. I didn't let it go to shit. I was like, oh, I'm probably going to get locked up again. And, oh, well. So September, my sobriety date's 9-12-12. So September 12th, 2012, I finally, after, you know, kicking heroin, which is a brutal, brutal withdrawal. I had 12 days of insomnia that was, I've never experienced now I know why people can never get off of it because the withdrawal is so hellacious and violent. I've been through violent shit in my life. I've been freaking beat up, stabbed, shot, all that stuff. And uh, there's nothing that compared to, to that because you, you can't sleep. Insomnia is a byproduct of the withdrawal from the opiates. And then your bones are shaking. You got like freaking like you're basically like going through exorcism. Got my first day of sleep, got sober, and then I got sober 9-12-12 was when I finally, because I was during the whole withdrawal, I was smoking a bunch of weed because I don't want to take like methadone or any of these pills to get off pills and get off, take drugs to get off drugs. I fucking hate that shit. And I'm like, you know what, dude, man the fuck up. You know, man the fuck up. I remember kicking heroin and putting on an all black hoodie and just leaving. I used to live down the street this way in Carlsbad and just going, I read some some forum on online about Exercise will exemplify your symptoms and make it worse, but it'll make your recovery time period shorter. So I'm like, perfect. If anybody knows how to freaking work out, and you, when you're withdrawn from that shit, you don't want to do nothing except your bones ache. So it makes you want to sit in a jacuzzi all day just to like, you know, that or just get high again. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. To me, that wasn't an option anymore, or else I was going to die or go to prison forever. So I got up and I went on a six mile run, and I was. It was in the middle of August. And I was disgusted with myself, and my bones hurt. And I was just like, you know what, though? I know I'm on that path. I think I'm going to do it. And I finally remember I got my first night of full sleep. I actually woke up to my alarm going off. I wasn't laying there, Mm -hmm. and then it went off because at that time I was kicking. Uh, Chris is a buddy of mine who was a godsend, too. He was a sober guy, and he allowed me to work construction, just doing labor shit around the job site while I was kicking heroin and try to get my life back together, whether I was going to go back into training or fire or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I remember calling him going like, dude, I feel like I won the lottery. I finally got four hours of sleep. Holy shit. And I was just like enlightened, but I never really, I never really got back into the program enough. So that was nine, 12, September 12, 2012, October, November, December, uh, oh, actually, September and then October, I was 22 days back in my sobriety. I witnessed a man harassing a young girl at Moonlight mm-hmm. um, who was a sex offender. Um, and I told him to stop. And she looked like he was like a jogger. Or she was jogging. He was like accosting her. Mm-hmm. Come to find out he had a history of crimes against women. And I fucked him up. I, you know, you could see his skull coming through his forehead. Like, it was pretty bad, dude. And I was scared. And I was sober, too. You know, but I wasn't... There's being sober and there's being a life in sobriety. And let me just clear that up for people that listen to this. Sober is just, you don't have any drugs or alcohol in your system. But you can still be a fucking asshole. If you don't change your ways just because you get off drugs doesn't mean you've really changed much. You're just not getting high, right? We have a saying in the program, just because you're a drunk horse thief and you got sober and you're still stealing horses, 
you're just a sober horse thief. So really not much has changed, right? But then, so that's just being sober. If you don't change your, your attitude and your characteristics, then it doesn't matter. But a life of sobriety is working the steps, giving back to somebody that's going through the heartache and pain you went through and allowing that to change your life while you're changing their life. So that's a life of sobriety is being of service, uh, whether you're feeding the homeless or going and doing, you know, speaking on a panel in front of a halfway house full of kids that are come from drug addicted families or coming out of prison, that stuff that you can relate to them, they can relate to you in your story. So I wasn't in the life of sobriety. So I got in trouble for kicking this dude in the head. Um, one kick was pretty bad. Um, speaking of kicking dudes in the head at the beginning, of the, I don't know why I use that metaphor. Maybe it's still in the back of my mind, yeah. which wasn't right. Doesn't matter if this dude was a freaking piece of shit. That's God's. To me, that's 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 God. I could have held him and then called the cops and not gave him Brandon's justice because all that did was result in another term behind bars because I had a strike and two prison priors for violent offenses. Never had any drug charges. But I always did stupid shit either under the influence. Mm-hmm. It, technically, I was sober. So here I am coming out of two prison terms, like through the past 10 years, and like going, finally got my life back together. I became a firefighter. I was coaching athletes, and you know, I was Billy Badass, and I had a story to tell, but I allowed myself to focus on myself um, in a negative light. What I mean by that is I thought I was freaking my shit didn't stink, and that allowed the enemy to come back in and freaking sideswipe me again. So. That was on October 2nd, 2012, 22 days into my sobriety or after, you know, five, six months of heroin usage from blowing my knee out in February 2012. So I turned myself in. The judge recognized that I was trying to change my life. He had no idea that I was coming out of a relapse. But all he knew is like, oh, this dude's been a firefighter. and But he's got a strike prior for a gun and two prison priors, one of which was for an armed robbery. And now he's fucking this dude up, even though this dude... The judge had a daughter, thank God. Mm-hmm. And this dude admitted, even though we couldn't find her, admitted to talking to a girl. And the, and also he had a history of girl issues, if you will. So the judge goes, look, dude, I can't slap you. He basically told my lawyer, Chamber Chambers, I see this kid's done well, but he still can't do what he was doing. So the best I have for you is either he fights this case and goes away for 10 years with enhancements and everything, or he takes a second strike and I'll put him away for a year in county jail which will be way different uh, aggravated uh, it'll be what is it is a, it was like a, a, a minor felony as opposed to a major felony because mm-hmm. you're not doing state prison time you're doing county time so my lawyer being the fighter that he is was like didn't want me to take that second strike I'm like dude I fucked the dude up like I gotta pay my debt to society and, and him ultimately because once again, God's going to deal with that dude, whatever he's done in his life. It's not on me. So that was in October. I turned myself in, went through a bunch of questioning. They let me go. They finally found him. They questioned him. They called me back in. They arrested me. Then my mom and my grandma and my sister bailed me out because we found out by grace of God with a with a history like me, I should have had at least, you know, $2 million bond, but it was only 33000 My sister was working for a paralegal, so they only had to put down three grand to get me out. I was laying in my cell on a Friday night, and they called, Glade, do you want to go home? And I damn near fell off the bunk, <laughs> and, you know, through the little intercom, yeah. Glade, want to leave? I'm like, is this some kind of sick joke? <laughs> yeah. Like, all right, they're like, get all your, get all your, your, uh, your county property together. Don't talk to nobody when you're leaving the cell block. Don't pass any notes. I'm like, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. And I just finished praying with my soulmate, which is very odd in the sense of he was going through a lot heavier shit than me. He beat his ex-girlfriend's boyfriend up with a baseball bat pretty bad, and uh, he had never been locked up before, but he freaking thrashed the dude pretty severely, and he was probably looking at a lot of time, and he was the kind of guy that, you know, punks inside jail take advantage of like you know take their food and make them their not let's say one thing too nobody gets boned in the butthole in prison that's a hollywood thing unless you came in gay and you and you found someone else that's gay that wants to do that with you like that's a hollywood bullshit myth there's another myth i want to displace <laughs> okay but uh you know so i prayed with him like to give him strength and just deal with your consequences and be okay with whatever happens and you'll get through it and then they call me out, and they, I got bailed out. I know it was my mom, my sister, and my grandma at the time that all pitched in a grand apiece. And um, 
I remember running all the way from Vista Jail at 7.30 at night through Calavera Trails in flip-flops, board shorts, and a tank top, crying my eyes out. <clears throat> I get choked up thinking about it because it was like, when you don't, if you go through the shit I went through, there's no freaking way you can say there is no God. There's no way you can't say there's a higher power out there greater than yourself that wants to restore you to sanity and have the best life for you if you choose to do the right thing. So I'm running I'm running these trails that I've ran my whole life. Calveras is the second I can run it in pitch black and my parents live, you know, I was like, if I leave the Vista jail, I want to surprise them. So I'm gonna cut through Calaveras, walk through these back neighborhoods out of the out of the Vista jail into the the uh, community they were living in at the time on the other side of Calaveras. So I did and I made it. First thing it is, I walk in, my mom looks at me and she's like, You stupid ass. My mom was a good Christian woman, but she's like tough love, right? Like, how many times are you gonna fuck up? And there was my dad, and my dad was always the one that was like, Here, son, here's a 20 spot. I know you don't have any money. Like, my dad always was the more softer. Um, so, my aha moment where I really changed was that was in October. November, December was court dates finally got my sentencing January 12th of January 15th of 2013 I went it back into county jail um, the system's super overcrowded so if you do a county year you'll usually do like six months four to months to six months because it's so overcrowded and if you're not a problem you know they'll just kick you out so they released me which I didn't think they were going to release me early to a work furlough with an ankle bracelet on where I just lived at, I lived in southeast San Diego in the hood and uh, every morning at a bus stop, my buddy Pat created a, f- a fictitious job for me just to get me out of work furlough because it was still a bunch of scoundrels in there. And I just wanted to work if he had work. And his office was at his house. So if they came to check on me, we were cool, right? Um, so when I got out, you know, I had moved back in with my parents after I got out and went to work furlough for three weeks and then went home. And then I lost my dad um, October 13, 2013. And when I put my dad away, I was, uh, my dad never left my side. Like, my mom, I know why, because that's how she deals with shit. But my dad was always like, he would drive to fucking the middle of Egypt if that's where the prison was to visit me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and my mom, my mom was there too. But she was, like I said, she was tough love at a point where, like, <laughs> I know he's safe. He's got three hots and a cot <laughs> and a job. And, you know, I've gotten into firefighting while I was locked up in training. So, and he's done this a couple times, so he'll be fine. I don't need to go visit his ass right now. But my dad always came. So my dad passed away, which just has a lot to do with being healthy, too, because diabetes eventually killed my dad. Mm. Um, that was my aha moment. I was like, you know what, Dad? You got to, you passed, and you got to see me sober. And uh, and that was the most beautiful thing ever. And... Um, and that's all I wanted, but I wanted him to see me successful too, and not not money, and not houses, not cars, none of that, because that shit don't matter. But successful with like maybe a wife and a kid and health, and um, you know, he got to see me get out of prison, and become a firefighter, but then he saw me screw up again and get high again and go through that roller coaster. But my dad never gave up on me, so I never gave up on my dreams. And uh, with that being said, that was my aha moment. I said, you know what? Enough's enough. Enough's enough of Brandon. Brandon needs to get out of fucking the good Brandon's way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I knew God had put me in fire, and he put me in personal training for a reason. And everything else revolves around that, the surfing and the skating and the good friends and family and the networking and guys like Jason Waiten, who always was there for me. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, so that's that was to come back to the question you first asked. So I know I, y'all have to bear with me. <laughs> ADD, we go on major tangents. It might last fifteen to twenty minutes. So, but to back, that was my aha moment. Was when my dad died, I was empowered because of the way he was. He freaking worked his ass off. He was a furniture salesman. Yeah. When he married my mom. My mom had my two brothers and my sister from a prior marriage, and I was, a, I was a little bastard kid from a boyfriend, and I was a year and a half old when he married my mom. So technically, he was my stepdad, but mm-hmm. you know what? They say blood's thicker than water, but if you love somebody enough, it doesn't matter if, if they're actually blood or not. 
Like, talk about a man. Dude, that dude came in and raised four kids that weren't his yeah. by blood. Loved the mom enough and worked his ass to the bone. Took You want to talk about a vacation when you have four kids that get to bring one friend each? That's eight fucking kids. <laughs> That's crazy. And dude, and he would rent a van and take everybody. Yeah. You know, we would go on surf and safaris up the coast of California go trip out on all the street performers in San Francisco and then come back and like that's how I grew up take everyone to Catalina yeah. and I watch him dude and the dude we complain about traffic and commuting the dude compu- co- computed um, well he would if he would have been alive it would have been computing today yeah. but he commuted to LA um, you know every day of the week wow. Monday through Friday you know shit that people don't do no more because for one you ain't gonna get there when you want to and traffic was still traffic back then although it's gotten worse but you didn't know the difference you know, so he set that precedence for me where he told me one time, Brandon, he said, and this this is for anybody and anything that's in your life, a very, very generic uh, quote. And he said, if you want it, you can have it. That's whatever you want. You can have it. How bad do you want it, though? Mm-hmm. What well, do you really do? You know, you see these dudes that are freaking big, cut, ripped, successful, uh, have a great clientele base. They didn't get it overnight. They didn't get it in two years. They freaking worked their asses off. They woke up and responded to emails at 3 a.m. I always use this acronym about Jason waiting because I was with that guy and I followed the dream with him. And he would come in like a zombie every day. It's like I didn't sleep last night because his new business venture was his baby. And that's a lot on your shoulders. So I learned a lot from Jason on like... Oh, I wish I could be Jason. Like, nah, homie, you don't want to be him. <laughs> that dude's fucked up right now. Yeah, he ain't yeah. slept in a week. Yeah. He's got a payroll that he can't pay, you know, but he's had people that believed in him, you know, and the shit that he's gone through to get to where he's at now with Nakoa. And I respect that, you know, and uh, respect that to the highest extent. So that's my biggest thing is like, if you want it, you can have it. And, um, and don't wait for an aha moment either, man. Just find your passion. Mm. That's it. It's that simple. If you don't want to freaking sit in an office, whether that's what you want to do or not, and you have an idea and you think money's going to make you happy, no. Your passion's going to make you happy. And if you can make some cash at having your passion be your source of income, then you won. Yeah. You won. doesn't matter if you're in a mansion or an apartment. You won. And that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line for me. I like that tangent. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. I mean, um, just from looking up, you know, pictures and stuff uh, on uh, Facebook and stuff like that, I just really see how close you were to your, to your dad and what kind of influence he was. Without, I mean, I, mean, I, I read two sentences and I can just, you can just tell the, by the, the love in your guys' eyes. And he just, I could just, I, I've never met him. And I, uh, I can have the picture of him in my in my mind while you're saying that it's really an awesome yeah, story. Yeah, I wish he was yeah. my real dad because the, the motherfucker was six four, two hundred and fifty pounds. <laughs> a lot of hair, man. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, <laughs> and I was uh, I'm five eleven, uh, one hundred ninety pounds. Which yeah. Yeah, I'm not bummed, but no, yeah. So no, he was a great man, a great example, and uh, you know all I can do is give back this the way give and love the same way he gave and loved and, you know yeah in all aspects of life what's your um daily um kind of uh, structure look like how do you stay on on track like from your first hour of your day um to the rest of your day obviously you're very high energy so um you know that, that may come in i know for myself i gotta take a nap but you know i'm up early and i and I, 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 I pass out but what does it look like for you what's your um average day look like so i'm up um, I'd like to be up earlier, but I'm up every day by 5.30. Um, generally, my first clients, um, I don't start them until 6.30, 7 o'clock. Because if I can't give you my full emotion and passion and, and good coaching, just because you want to come in and be a 5 a.m. client, then I'm not going to book you at 5 a.m. Yeah. But I still get up fairly early, some days earlier than others, because I'll be thinking about things. Um, I love my coffee. Yeah. So that that's first. I'm a French press kind of guy. <laughs> so uh, I get in there, and depending on how much grounds I pour in that freaking carafe, uh, I mean, I, I can either go freaking full, you know, bonker status. Yeah. Or I can just keep it, whatever. So I make that. Um, I'll definitely say my prayers, you know, be grateful. Um, I always tell everybody, my biggest thing is like, you know what? You can start off by going, at least you woke up. You fucking woke up, dude. Mm-hmm. That's a chance right there. Mm-hmm. Oh, you opened your eyes. Because we can't predict the future. Five minutes from now, I don't know if you and I will be sitting here. 
You know, you can say, well, come on, yeah. But, you know, hypothetically speaking, tomorrow is now promised. Yeah. You take, I would tell people, I go, you, because I surf, they're like, hey, man, you, are you ever worried about attacked by sharks? I go, dude, every day you merge in traffic on the freeway, you take a chance at your life. Mm. So why am I going to worry about something that I love, you know? I, not that I dislike driving. Like, if I'm cruising to the mountains to snowboard or, you know, down to Baja to surf, then I don't mind driving. But nonetheless, I think... Uh, the chance that you have every day when your eyes open is a chance for you to be badass at life. Yeah, you know. Do you uh, do you journal or anything? Do you or uh, is it what, what's your um, no, spiritual practice? I don't. Like? I don't. I, I uh, Mondays are pretty booked. Um, I'm coaching all day. Uh, I get done and I go to my men's group meeting in Vista, um, and that's at seven thirty to eight thirty. So by the time I get home, it's six thirty. I shower. I eat drive out to deep vista by 7 30 when i'm done at 8 30 i get back here it's 8 45 9 o'clock and my day's done tuesday same thing i go to a tuesday night men's prayer group meeting at north coast calvary chapel in carlsbad which is rad because it's not aa but everyone talks about their their feelings and they share a praise report and a prayer request Mm -hmm. And everyone in there is way grayer than me, so I'm surrounded by all this great wisdom. So that's my Tuesdays all day. That starts, I get there late because that starts at, um, they always serve dinner first, so it starts at 5.50. So from 5.50 to 6, everyone's getting served and in their buffet line. And, you know, there's close to 50 to 60 gentlemen in there. And the average age in there is, I want to say, 55, 60. So it's a men's group? Yeah. Yeah. So I always go to men's group. I don't, I don't, I, in my therapy, I never, nothing against women, but... You know, as men, we need to iron sharpens iron, mm. and if we can learn how to build each other up and treat women properly and be their, let them be the queens in our life, then that's where I'm at. I, I stopped going to co-ed meetings um, as far as Alcoholics Anonymous goes, um, just because I saw the way people people are in there trying to hunt for pussy as mm. opposed to like let's get sober. You yeah, know what I mean, so that's mainly your spiritual practice is going to those meetings or well, yeah, uh, I mean, and, and, and prayer morning. and yeah. prayer. I just I pray. You know, as a Christian, I can be a better Christian, but that's my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe there's huge power in, in prayer. Prayer to where you're 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 captivated emotionally over whatever you're praying about, whether it's something as simple as. God, I pray I find a good price for this catalytic converter on my engine or somebody's sick or you need to make rent or whatever the case may be, you know. So that's my spiritual practice is that I don't um, I don't really do anything else. You know, I pray for everybody um, because I know that uh, I need it just as much, you know, and however people pray for me, I'm accepting of that, too, just because they might not share the same views of faith. I don't care about that. I just care that they're that they're happy, and uh, then I can I can be an intercessor between them and their issues and my faith, and they can do the same for me between my issues and their faith. You know, they can pray for me back. So, yeah, I don't get up. I don't meditate. Um, prayer is my meditation. I use when I'm driving to work. Also, as my Zen time, as far as like uh, prayer, singing, you know kumbaya and whatnot no i'm just kidding no kumbaya <laughs> but uh, yeah that's it i mean it's very simple um i keep it structured because i with with my scatterbrain if i don't i thrive under structure so yeah yeah you structure like calendar everything that kind of structure yeah. or i, ca- yeah. I structure it on that and i also write it in a calendar too yeah on that he's pointing to the ipad so. yes yes yeah. on that i mean I, I point at the ipad everybody <laughs> yeah. um Cool. Well, what is it that you would like to leave people with? Well, I mean, I think it's complex and simple all in, all in, all in one shot in the sense of if you want it, you can have it. If you want to have, I don't care if it's superficial, man. Everyone's got to live their life and what's going to make them happy. But I believe that if they go through for something that is their passion, that nothing can stop them and they can go do whatever they want to do in life they just have to find what they're passionate about it doesn't matter what it is man in the day and age of social media too do you realize how much free advertisement that is and if you use it in a positive way like dude social media has been a godsend to me I remember back in my crappier times when I first I think I first got on Facebook back in 2007 or 8 uh I think it's 08 because I got out of my last prison term 
in July of 08 and uh, and my friend showed it to me and I was like oh that's stupid you guys are dumb freaking Facebook you know and then when Instagram came out it said the same thing Instagram <laughs> right. and then I realized maybe I should get one because yeah. not only that my family and friends are on there you can reconnect but you know the way it's this metamorphosis for businesses and no matter what your business is mm-hmm. I don't care if you're a realtor or do what you and I do yeah um, but yes if they use the tools that technology has given us to directly complement their passion in life and what they want to do, nothing will stop you. Nothing. Excuses are excuses. You know, you can do whatever the fuck you want to do, but you have to be willing to grind. You have to let the alarm clock be drowned out by that voice inside you that makes you get up when you're tired, that makes you go the extra mile when you might have to miss a meal. You have to be willing to grind if you want to to do what you want to do because it's not going to come easy. But the reward is happiness, it's uh, clarity, it's direction, um, and it's complete joy. Joy, to me, is above happiness. Joy is a full fulfillment of what life has to give you. Um, And obviously the higher power for me is is God's all big in that picture. But the joy is, is what is waiting for you when you find your passion and like I said, if you can make money at it too, that's a beautiful thing. Because you know, like the old saying is, if you have a job you love, you never have to work another day in your life. Which is kind of yeah. bullshit because sometimes work's work and you have <laughs> yeah. clients that piss you off. and Or you're on your period for the day too. You know, I'm not yeah. perfect. Sometimes I come in cranky, but <laughs> yeah. So that's what I leave people with, man. Follow your passion and allow that voice inside to be louder than your alarm clock. Get up and grind, baby. Go get yeah. it because you can have it if you want it. Yeah. Where, where can uh, people, uh, two, th- two things, where can people find you? And um, tell us a little bit about the project you've got going on, about your uh, um, your documentary. With your yeah, story. so people can find me um, on Facebook. It's Brandon Glade, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, Glade, like the air freshener, G-L-A-D-E. Wish I was related to them. But I come to find out a Glade is a meadow without trees, so it's just a... Anyways, yeah, so you can find me, Brandon Glade, on Facebook or at Glade Pro on Instagram. That's G-L-A-D-E-P-R-O. Um, I'm working on a project right now where we are, um, I'm working with a guy named Jade Dio, and he is on Instagram. It's called at, at Smarter Surfer. Um, and we're just doing a documentary about my life story, man, to hope to reach other people that they can, you know, battle their demons and, and live the life that they dreamed of. If they're willing to work at it, never, ever let their shortcomings take them down for good. And you can do whatever you want to do. So I've I've been blessed to have this guy find me and want to do a story about my life. And my biggest thing is it's not about me. It's about letting my story let others achieve happiness, fulfillment, greatness. Maybe drive the car you want to drive. That's fine. That's what you want. Live where you want to live. Um, And... um, just be able to help others too and be a shining light in your community and allow your story and your experience, strength, and hope to help others. So that's what I want my story to do. So that's the Brandon Glade story. We haven't really, that's not, that's an unofficial name, but uh, hopefully it'll be out by this fall. But there's a lot of, a lot of stuff we need to do. We just filmed the armed robbery scene last Wednesday, which was interesting. So mm-hmm. it's kind of emotional going back, going like, dude, you were, you were a spun out freaking motherfucker. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. well, I'll, I'll have all the uh, for those out there listening. I'll have everything that's linkable um, on the in the show notes and um, all of your socials on there, so people can find you and everything. And, and I really want to thank you for being on the show. I just think you're an extraordinary human being, and it's really been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, Rob. Well, I love you too, brother. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. God bless everybody. Stay strong. All righty, and there you have it. There's Brandon Glade. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I enjoyed doing the interview. Um, Before you go, if you would like to receive an email from me, um, it's my monthly newsletter, and it's all about what I'm up to to optimize my life, whether it's my diet, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, um, all the quirky shit that I'm digging up. Go to my website, robertbud.net, and drop your email in the spot where it says newsletter, and you will get the very next one. Also, if you want to hear any of the other podcasts that I've done, go to robertbud.net forward slash podcasts. 
and uh, all of them are in there. And if you would be so kind to rate the show on iTunes, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much if you do that. Also, uh, if you want to leave a comment, I know some of you have tried to leave comments and questions. Probably the easiest place to do that is on my Facebook page, which is Robert Budd. Uh, Either my personal or professional page, either one would be great. And if you have a question for the guest, you can drop it in there and I'll make sure they get it. So with that being said, have a beautiful day, a beautiful life, and until next time, adios.